but we've got no direct knowledge of that reaction field. And we need some way to be able to formulate the process in a way that we do have direct control over an engineering process. Say, i.e. Remember, the B is the primary field, just like E was the primary field. It can produce a reaction field. or dipoles being brought into existence. <coughs> now I've got little currents when we're dealing with a magnetic response. So before we had that the curl the B field the case we had for statics, and as soon as we introduce material of some kind, anything, this could be glass, concrete, anything you can imagine as material, what happens is that we induce a Induced current density. And again, it's a function of the applied B field. So it's a very similar procedure that we had for electrostatics. last time was to always express things in terms of what we know. This is the bit we don't like. It's the induced bit. It's hidden within the system. We don't know what's going on. So what we do is we try to smuggle it over to the left-hand side so that we express everything in terms of what we do know, which is the, the actual, usually the surface current densities here. So these induced current densities are going to be within a volume of some kind. Our aim, therefore, is to is to bring it across to the left hand side, which means that we can define a magnetization field. In the same way we defined D, we can define another quantity that allows us to make that transformation. So, we do that. We bring on to the other side the term that we're having trouble with, which is the induced field. And on the left hand side we have what we do know. So what we can do is define now a new quantity.
it's called here M. doing is now rewriting this, this is induced term in terms of the new field quantity that we've developed. So as you can see quite clearly, all we're doing now is gathering together under the one operator, the curl operator. The magnetization field we've just created that takes account of the induced current density. And we collapse all of these terms into one new symbol, which we give the letter H. And that historically has always been referred to in the literature as the magnetic intensity. It's not the read the real field. So when you're reading the textbooks or the, or the notes, don't see the H field as the real magnetic field. It's a pseudo. It's, a, it's created purely because of our ignorance about the magnetization response in the material. Only the B field is the real field, the magnetic field. So this is how Maxwell's equations are rewritten when you've got material present. Rather than talking about curl cross V, you talk about curl cross H, and the rest of the formulation is as before. You just replace B with H or E with D in order to maintain the equations. Since it's um, effectively Ampere's law, we'll just talk about that being the, the macroscopic Ampere's law.
So we have that the magnetic intensity is a function of the B field. Specifically, we have that it is related in this fashion. This also can be related by a matrix operator so that U in XY, U, X, Z, Y, Y, Z, Z. So you can populate the rest of it. So it has a very similar form, and likewise, if you have unit entry on the main diagonal, it's, it's saying to you that the material has, it's, it's, it's isotropic. But you start to get gyrotropic behaviour once you have off-diagonal elements that are non-zero, which means uh, ferrite plates, for example, if the, if the electric vector is polarised coming into such material, it will get rotated. Faraday rotation is one of the consequences of this particular operator matrix if you have non-zero off-diagonal elements. The last topic I need to do with you before you pass over to Dr. Dubrovka, because he's going to look at this, the subject of waveguiding, which is the application of all that I've been talking to you about uh, so far. This time, next week, we, enter, we, we start the last topic in this area, which is uh, boundary conditions. And it's related to the fact that when you get to waveguides, waveguides can be of circular cross-section or rectangular cross-section. Inside the waveguide, you might have vacuum, you might have uh, polystyrene, or air, or anything. So then you've got here a metal wall of a certain thickness. So you can, let's say you've got air inside, then you've got metal and then you've got air or whatever on the outside. So this curve here is just some generic way of saying that we've got a boundary between one region of space and another region of space. In this region of space, the material is characterized by a certain electric polarization response and a magnetic polarization response. On the other side of the boundary, we have different electric and magnetic polarization responses. What we have to do is maintain continuity of the primary fields B and E as we cross the boundary. So B and its response field H, E and its response field D have to have continuity. This is the last topic I'll uh, deal with um, next Tuesday and then you'll be ready to understand work into what we mean by waveguides and how electromagnetic radiation signals can propagate down waveguide. So waveguides are used to deliver power 
from a generator. So, for example, on uh, anything from warship platforms. So, if you ever go down to Portsmouth and you, you see the destroyer sitting in the docks and they've got their radars turning, they're effectively operating waveguide, box waveguide of this sort of dimension, 915 megahertz waveguide, and they're pumping out several hundred kilowatts of power so that uh, any pigeon unfortunate enough to fly across the face of that radar this will drop out of the sky uh, almost immediately and be cooked internally because the instantaneous power is massive and it needs to be able to give a weapons platform uh, a visualisation of about a few tens of kilometres out from uh, the vessel itself. So if it's a carrier and it wants to be able to launch aircraft if there's inbound uh, attackers. Or the waveguides are used to deliver power to earth station antennas. So these, from, so from generators, you have very high uh, electromagnetic fields that are transferred from a power station to the big earth station antennas. These are the dishes that are about 100 foot across so that they can launch a beam that will reach maybe milliwatt values by the time it gets to the geostationary orbiting satellite. So whether it's a circular cross-section or um, rectangular cross-section, you need to be able to transport power efficiently. Waveguides are very efficient over short trunk hall distances of tens of kilometres. You need to go to antennas if you want to be able to carry signals much further. So we're dealing with the short haul, high power carriers at this point. This Friday, there will be no lecture or tutorial. The first group of you are going to start Lab 1, and tomorrow I will um, email uh, all of you updated lab notes that you read in order to do uh, this lab. There are some slight changes to what you can read on the laboratory link now on the course webpage. It's just been uh, slightly updated, but for those of you this Friday doing that lab, there's no lecture so that you can have time to uh, prepare, read, and do that laboratory without worrying about a lecture. For those of you in the second group, I'm, I'll hold a, uh, a surgery hour in my room. If you, if you wish to, uh, to come to my room uh, to review any particular thing I've covered to date, uh, just drop in. There may or may not be others there, but we'll just go through material that way. Otherwise, the hour is free for you to catch up on other coursework from other subjects. Uh, or to lie on the grass if it's not raining. Do whatever you want. It's up to you, OK? So the, this Friday, nothing. It's for you to catch up, think, read, sleep, whatever. So the next Tuesday, I will finish this last topic. And then that will be it. And then from then on, you'll have Dr. Dabrovka until the end of the course. OK? Mm -hmm. What's the, How's the, the registration magnetic? sheet going? Up the back now? Sweet. Yeah.